which Martha Quinn calls it Night Ranger accent on the first one, and everybody else is like Night Ranger. It's like, what is it? Is it Night Ranger or is it Night Ranger? It's like, that's a that's a tricky one there. Jack Blades from Night Ranger, and Damn Yankees. Actually, it's a funny story. The name Night Ranger came, we were called Ranger. We made it, we, you know, when we cut our record deal with Boardwalk Records, we were Ranger. In fact, somewhere there's, they printed up 10,000 album covers of the Dawn Patrol album that says Ranger. And about a week and a half before we released that thing, we were paging through Billboard magazine, and here's like a big full page ad, this country band, The Rangers. And they had the, you know, they've been a band for 20, 30 years, and their fathers had a band, and their grandfathers started the band right after the Civil War. So, you know, I mean, they had the name forever, forever. And we're like, we're screwed. We're completely screwed. I mean, what do we do here? What do we do? Everybody's freaking out, freaking out. And I had written a song called Night Ranger on the first album. So I, I just called everybody. I called everybody and said, hey, what? You know, everybody's like, what do we do with this? this is I said, here's what we do. Dudes, we'll just put Night above the name Ranger in the same thing. Because we got the song Night Ranger. And they're like, yeah, you think it's right? I'm saying, it's going to be great. It'll be great. We'll be Night Ranger, you know, or Night Ranger. It'll be wonderful. And I hang up the phone. I'm like, we're fucked. We're completely <laughs> screwed. You know, we're dead. We're dead in the water. But that's what we did, and that's how we evolved into Night Ranger. The first four Night Ranger um, albums were the sort of like the classic era for Night Ranger. I mean, the first album came out, and this new thing called MTV was there. Right, and we're like, well, what do we gotta do? You have to film a video. Wait a minute, you can be a musician, but now you have to be an actor too. And we're like, okay, let's try that. So we got all our buddies from the UCLA film school, my friends that were going to college there, they checked out the gear on a Saturday, and we filmed this video for Don't Tell Me Love Me for next to nothing. I mean, total guerrilla style. Went to, in LA, went to train town in LA, and didn't even get permits, and just cut the thing, and did it, and everything like that. And then we went on tour, MTV probably had like, six videos at the time. So they got our video and started banging that thing like 14 times a day. And suddenly every time we went into, we were like TV stars. It was crazy. It was wild. And that just like, boom, that blasted Night Ranger. That with the fact that here's like twin guitars on Don't Tell Me You Love Me, you know, jumping around, excitement, all that kind of stuff. And it just, yeah, everything went just flying, you know, from that, it just took off and blasted off. Next thing we knew, we had a million selling record in Dawn Patrol. and. Then the next thing we knew is our record company went bankrupt, which was Boardwalk Records. It just went under. One day we called up and there was like, hello, nobody there, you know? And so, so our, our manager pulled us off, this, off the tour right away, right into the studio to cut another album, and that was the Midnight Madness album. They negotiated a deal with um, MCA Records, and we were on MCA, went into the studio, cut the record in like a month and a half, went immediately back out on the road again, and this is what it was like for the first four albums of Night Ranger. I mean, we'd do 18 month tours, we'd be home three weeks, if that, and then we'd go right in the studio for two months to cut a new record. And it was boom, 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 boom. I mean, we blinked from 1982, and suddenly it was 1987. It was like that. It was so, everything just happened so fast, and, and we just kept touring and touring and touring. And that's kind of what happened. I think what happened was that um, Night Ranger had us, I mean, so we, we started, like, our record company would only let us, at that point, they only saw us as a ballad band because Sister Christian was so popular. Then Sentimental Street was a top ten hit. And then Goodbye was a big record. So it was like ballads, 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 when Night Ranger really is just an American straight-ahead kick-ass rock band. And um, so with us, we kind of got in a catch-22 for us in that 1987, 1988, where, where our music, like, they would only release us, and they kind of pushed us in a direction that really wasn't us. And so, in, in the meantime, I mean, music at that time was, was evolving, but it was still more evolving into, you know, when we came out, it was like Journey, Def Leppard, um, Van Halen, uh, you know, I mean, uh, just really kick-ass rock bands and everything. The music sort of 
moved into sort of, you know, a lot of sort of like what they call the hairband world, you know, and, and for us, it was, we were more of the before that, a bit before that, you know, and everything like that. So, so when that, that music was changing and those bands were getting popular and everything was going that direction and Night Ranger was only being allowed to do sort of release and being known for ballads and I think that really caused the demise of the beginning of, of, of I mean, of Night Ranger at that point. I think it was, it was sort of like the, the easiest route, the easiest direction. Okay, they sold millions of records with a ballad, Put out another ballad. Go with another ballad. Let's do ballads. 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 Like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. We're rocking. We're, you know, we're rock band. Right? It didn't matter. It was ballad, ballad, ballad. And I think that sort of, for us, was the beginning of the end for the for that era of Night Ranger up into 1989. Well, I mean, really, all that came about was like in in 1988 we. We played this, I remember, man, we played this last show in, in Philadelphia, and I was like, you know, the band, Night Ranger, everybody was going in a different direction. Everybody wanted to, you know, let's, I want to write the song, I want to do this, I want to do And everything was just going crazy like that. And so I, just, I personally just said, you know what, everybody just do what you want to do. I'm out of here. You guys, everybody just, everybody do what they want to do. Everybody thinks they have, they know what they want to do, so everybody go do what they want to do. And, and I just basically quit Night Ranger, and about, I don't know, about, about three days later, my buddy Vince Neal called me and said, what's going on? I said, I just quit my band. He said, what? He said, why don't you come up, you know, I'm, we're, we're, we're cutting an album up in Vancouver. So I went up with Vince when they were doing the, um, um, the Dr. Feelgood album. And um, uh, the whole band was sober at that time, Motley Crue. And so I just went up there for 10 days and hung out with Vince. And he got a two-bedroom um, um, condo. And we just sat up and talked all night long, like, what are we going to do? What's going on? What are you know, I sang on their record and all that kind of stuff. And, and I just, it was a good sort of like experience for me just to sit back. It was almost like a retrospective. Okay, here's what I did in my, here's what I'm doing. What should I do now? And we just, it was good to be with Vince who was a buddy of mine and just, just bullshitting and just talking about things and music and everything like that and it was really, really a good time for me. I came right back from that and got a phone call from John Claudner from, uh, from uh, Geffen Records and he said, look, I have Tommy Shaw and Ted Nugent in the studio in New York, but it seems like something is missing. Um, I would never pull you out of another band, but now that you're not doing Night Ranger, why don't you go to New York and check it out? So he flew me to New York and that first weekend we wrote like, you know, half the Damn Yankees album. That was the beginning of the Damn Yankees. So, <laughs> once again, I was like, right from the boom, 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 immediately right into another project. Didn't even think, didn't even do anything, right into it. That was a, um, that was, it was a good creative period for myself and for Tommy. I mean, at, at that point, like after the second Damn Yankees, you know, both those records sold so well and we had great tours and everything like that. And then Tommy and I were writing songs for everyone from like Alice Cooper to Aerosmith, you know, to um, Ozzy Osbourne to Cher to, I mean, we were doing tons of songwriting. So it was really a fun time, actually. And then our record label, Warner Brothers Records, said, why don't you guys do a record? So we did the first Shaw Blades record and right at that time, right when Shaw Blades was really uh, Shaw Blades record was released, that's when all the guys in the record company decided they needed to shave their heads and be cool and and all that kind of stuff. And that was the real turning point. And that was like '95, actually. I mean, it was that was the crazy time where where we put out a Shaw Blades record, which is really more of like an Americana record which is a great album, the Shaw Blades Hallucination record. And um, they did, Warner Brothers did absolutely nothing with it. And the, the new regime came in, they cut, it, it, they didn't want to do anything. And in fact, they paid Damn Yankees a million dollars not to do another Damn Yankees record. We're like, really? Okay, we'll just take the check. You know, why not? You know, I mean, that was how, how it was because Damn Yankees had sold so many records and we were so recouped and so the, our next, in, in our contract, the next thing was like, we got a million bucks to do an album. And they just paid us the million dollars not to do the record. I mean, that's how much nobody wanted anything to do with that era and style of music. 
at that same time, I mean, I was, like I said, writing songs for tons of other artists, doing a lot of things. I mean, I had records on Get a Grip album, Ozzy's Osmosis, Cher's Greatest Hits. I mean, I wrote a couple of songs with the Journey guys that, and uh, other, we were on the Armageddon soundtrack. So I had, I, and I had a large, you know, publishing, di I mean, I had a great time. It was a wonderful time for me, you know? And, and we had just come off the Shaw Blades thing, and I'm like, whatever. And that's when I got a phone call from the Night Ranger guys. Tommy went back to do um, Sticks in 96, and um, the Night Ranger guys called me and said, hey, let's go to Japan, do some shows. So I said, well, why not? Let's do that. So I mean, we put one show on for sale, sold out. Another show, sold out. Another show, sold out. Another show. It was like boom, boom, boom. So that was the beginning of the reformation of of, of the sort of rebirth, actually, if you want to call it that, of, uh, of Night Ranger. I mean, we went out and we'd, maybe we'd do 30 shows a year. We'd play shows and people still loved it. People still rocked and everything like that. But, it, you know, you could see everything was changing and cats were really like, you know, everything was like, I mean, look what they did to, to Kip Winger, you know, with that Beavis and Butthead bullshit. You know what I mean? I mean, that was unbelievable. And like, you know, Metallica, the dude shooting an arrow into, into Kit. You know, I mean, that really, they shoved it, you know, they shoved it right up his ass and that was fucked up. That was really, that was really, as if he was responsible for the whole world of everything so he can be, you know, a big fuck you to all those guys that, that really took him down and almost made him the poster boy for everything that they thought was wrong with the music of that. Well, you know what? I mean, for us, you know, I have, I, you know, because I write songs all the time for other people, for whatever. I mean, if I stop writing, that's when I start dying inside. You know, music is everything to me. You know, and a lot of bands, yeah, we'll just play, and there's no point because you're not getting airplay and stuff like that. I mean, it, if if we stop, I mean, it's a creative process. If you think of anyone, an artist, um, a a writer, um, anything, when you stop creating, that's when you start dying inside. You know what I mean? And so Night Ranger, it's like, we're not going to do that. We're going to keep writing new material. We're going to keep recording. We're going to keep creating, creating, creating until the day we die. I mean, I'm a musician. I was born, this is what I was born to do, right? I mean, there's no rule somewhere that says, okay, now that you're, now that you're not selling five million records every time you release a record, you shouldn't make a record. Hey, fuck you. You know, this is what I do. This is what is in me. This is my heart. I mean, the most inspiring thing I ever saw was I saw Les Paul on his 90th birthday playing a show at the Uridium in New York City. And it was, uh, it was unbelievable. I mean, it was Brad Gillis, Lita Ford, and I, and we're sitting in the audience. That was the most inspiring thing I ever saw. I mean, I hope that's me. You know, I hope that's me when I'm 90 years old because that's who I am, that's what I do. And anybody who says, you shouldn't be doing this, you should give it up, and uh, uh, fly, it's like, hey, fuck you. You know, fuck you. You go give up your life, asshole. I'm gonna keep doing what I do. And when you see Night Ranger play now, Night Ranger is like, you know, stronger and more powerful than it's ever been. We have more fun on, we have more fun now than we did in the 80s. You know what I mean? And that's because of who we are and what's in, it's inside of us. You know what I mean? And one thing that no one can take away from you is what's inside of you. You know, I mean, if there ever disappointments, sure, everyone has disappointments in their life. I mean, you, you, you know, you think about things, but disappointments always bring new adventures as far as I'm concerned. I was in a band in the, in the late 70s called Rubicon and we played Cow Jam 2 in front of 250,000 people in 1978. I mean it was a funk rock band. I was the bass player. I played you know slap style. I was like you know when I first moved to San Francisco I was doing sessions with Sly Stone at the record plant in Sausalito. I mean I had this thing going suddenly this band breaks up and I thought my life was over when I was 22. You know, it's like I was 22 years old and it was like, what? It's done. But then the next, the next like three months later, we formed this club band that was the genesis of Night Ranger. And so if I hadn't have had that heartbreak of Rubicon breaking up and I wasn't going to be this slap style bass player and all that kind of, I would have never been the front man, lead singer, songwriter 
for Night Ranger. And then when Night Ranger broke up, there never would have been a, you know, I mean, that was a tragedy. Didn't know what we were going to do. And boom, you know, we turn on a dime and suddenly here's the damn Yankees, the first super group out of that whole sort of arrow with, you know, with Nuge and Tommy Shaw, who are still two of my best friends to this very day. You know what I mean? And we created great music that people absolutely love. So, I mean, you know, there's disappointments in life, but disappointments sometimes are for the betterment of who you are and what you do. Mm -hmm.